So, so I wanted to describe some of the dipole interaction and use the remainder of maybe 10 minutes or so to um, do something mathematical with the dipole potential and the electric field due to a dipole. So let me talk about that uh, dipole interaction. I think uh, when I talk about dipole, I mainly want you to think about an object that's uh, uh, similar to how I was describing, describing the aluminum tab. Just an object with a separation between the charges, positive and minus, with some distance between them. So imagine you have an object like that, just lying around. And I guess it's uh, simplest if we imagine this distance as being constant. It won't always be the case, especially in the case of induced dipole. This <laughs> distance can be a function of applied electric field. That's the case with aluminum tap that you saw before. But um, for simplicity's sake, let's just say we have some kind of an object where you have, uh, it's a within the single object, you have a charge separation so that you can think of one end as having positive charge, the other one has, end as having negative charge of the same magnitude. And um, the easiest way to get an interaction between a dipole and, or easiest way to describe an interaction between a dipole and anything else is to simply talk about the interaction between an electric field and a dipole. This way, I'm kind of separating out the two sides of the interaction. Instead of thinking about almost limitless combinations of dipole interacting with the limitless number of other objects, I'm just imagining, let's just imagine some charge distribution generated on electric field. The simplest electric field I can imagine is a uniform constant electric field. So let me draw a representation of that. I have some region of space with a uniform electric field. I don't care how, well, uh, for the moment, I don't, uh, I don't worry about how that electric field was generated. And uh, this might be truly uniform, or I might be approximating something as being uniform by considering small enough a region where electric field doesn't change much. So, so if you imagine having this uh, dipole in this, uh, in this region of uniform field, there are a few things you can talk about. Let me just erase some of this. There are some things you can talk about. Um, I guess the easiest place to start from is what is the net force? Because that's usually the thing that we ask about whenever we are dealing with uh, mechanics. And this is a mechanical thing. I have a mechanical object. So the natural question to ask is what is the net force? And when you consider that, I think you will quickly see that net force becomes um, on, not as interesting with the dipole. So imagine I have charge of plus Q here, and I have charge of minus Q here. And okay, let's draw free body diagram. For the, this charge of plus Q, I have a force of QE pointing in the same direction as the electric field on this charge of minus Q. I have the force of magnitude QE pointing in the opposite direction as the electric field. And you can see that as an object as a whole, the net force here will add up to zero. And, and that's generally true. Whenever the electric field is uniform, the net force on a dipole will be zero. And uh, you know, this might kind of um, disagree, maybe even violently disagree with your intuition because in the very example I showed leading to this, didn't I show a force being applied on this aluminum tab, right? I mean, isn't this aluminum tab moving because of a net force? So what I mean net force is zero on a dipole. Um, the, any net force on a dipole has to involve a non-uniform electric field. 
there has to be uh, so the the uh, I don't know the derivative of the electric field has to be non-zero, so that there is a difference between the amount of force on one side of the dipole and the other side. So um, so you will see that <laughs> handled eventually in some upper division class. For the purpose of this class, I'll say with a uniform field, net force, net force on a dipole is zero uh, for a uniform field. And as far as the theoretical calculations go, we will almost never do calculation involving dipole and a non-uniform field. So with the net force being zero, there are still some interesting things that, that can happen to a dipole. When you look at this uh, arrangement of the charge in the field, what you are still seeing is that when, so I hope when you see a free body diagram like this, your intuition doesn't say that nothing interesting happens here because even though the net force might be zero, I hope the forces you see let, uh, makes you think, oh, it's gonna rotate. That's uh, so, so what we can talk about um, even with the net zero force is what the net torque would be. So there is going to be a net torque on the dipole. And um, for this, let me just give you the formula and I will leave that to, up to you to verify um, <laughs> that this formula is true. The net torque on a dipole, this is how I have it memorized, is the, the electric dipole moment cross product with the electric field. And these are all vector quantities. And these are all vector products. And um, for the purpose of uh, complete description, the, um, this uh, dipole moment as a vector quantity is defined to point in the direction of this uh, displacement vector D. And you know, the, and uh, the, the electric dipole moment is defined as the charge times D. <laughs> And uh, so let me just leave that there. I, I mean, this is the piece that I want to come back to when we start talking about the magnetic dipole. <laughs> Some of these formulas will just fit right into magnetic uh, dipole interaction descriptions. Um, but for the purpose of what we are talking about uh, right now, electrostatics, we won't really be using this uh, torque formula. So I'll just uh, state it, leave it there. But you can see it, uh, well, you can uh, figure it out on your own by analyzing this free body diagram. And one, well, second to last uh, thing to talk about with the dipole interaction is when you have a torque on an object, this uh, torque can do work. And when torque does work, that'll result, result in change of energy. In the case of conservative forces like electric force that work done by torque on a dipole will result in, it will result in energy being stored on that uh, dipole and the field arrangement. So you can kind of um, see it here. When you, this is sort of what I imagine when I, um, when I stare at this setup, I can kind of visual image, I can visualize, almost the image and visualizing. <laughs> I can visualize that if, I, if something was holding this dipole and you suddenly let go, it's just going to start rotating on its own because of the electric field. And what that indicates to me is that this dipole was in some setup that was at a higher potential energy and it's rotating into a position of lower potential energy. And you can, you can think about playing with this setup and kind of rotating it around, seeing what position would have highest potential energy, what position would have lowest potential energy. And when you're done, playing with it. <laughs> the position of the highest potential energy you will find is this one with a positive charge here, negative charge here. So the, the, the displacement vector and the dipole moment pointing anti-parallel to the electric field. 
because it's from this position where it will rotate around. And the position of lowest potential energy is this flipped around. If you have, uh, trying to get rid of that. Uh, I'll just leave that. Um, <laughs> so it's the, this one flipped around where you have negative charge here and positive charge here. And the dipole, the displacement and the dipole mo moment is pointing parallel to the electric field. That's the orientation where, so you can imagine once you have a, an electric dipole that's oriented this way, then further force, further electric force will simply keep it maintained at this position. So that's the position of lowest potential energy. And um, I'll leave this also for you to work out the detail. There's a formula <laughs> for the potential energy of a dipole interacting with an electric field. And that formula for the formula of uh, electric dipole is um, minus <laughs> P dot E, where P is the electric dipole moment defined here and is the electric field. And um, you can see it here where the, the, where the dipole moment is pointing the, in the same direction as electric field. So this uh, dot product is most positive it can be. The potential energy is the most lowest negative it can be. And when it's turned around and anti-parallel, its uh, potential energy is the highest it can be. And this formula is defined so that at the position of where it's perpendicular, it's defined to be zero. So, you know, with the potential energies, it's always the difference that's uh, uh, dynamically meaningful. And here the zero is set so where the dipole is at the 90 degree angle, where the torque on it is greatest. Not that that matters <laughs> for the definition. <laughs> So, so let me leave this uh, for you to consider and um, just know <laughs> I, uh, with that I did need to introduce this for reference again when we get to magnetic dipoles because um, these are some useful things to talk about when we have uh, physical objects that can be described as magnetic dipoles and um, the thing about magnetism is it's uh, sometimes difficult, sometimes not very intuitive, and it's good to have other analogies to fall back to, something more familiar that you can use to compare to see if uh, uh, what you're thinking about with uh, magnetism makes a sense in the more familiar context. Um, and let's see. I said this would be the second to last thing about interaction I would talk about. And um, yeah, I probably should do, at least do, do mention this, um, which is the, uh, the term and the idea of self energy. Um, it, this isn't something I think that we draw a lot of attention to deliberately in lower division. Um, but I, I think this is a, still an appropriate place to do that because, um, you know, by self-energy, we don't really mean anything <laughs> mysterious. You have, in fact, seen it. When we talk about energy stored in capacitor, we, you know, the formula for that is one half QV. And this is an example of self-energy. Uh, by self-energy, what all we mean is um, energy involved in um, energy that is involved in, stored in, um, distribution of charge itself. So what I want to distinguish here is that this particular energy here, it describes interaction between the dipole and something external, whatever the external thing it is that I must have used to set up this electric field. That's what that energy refers to. When I talk about self-energy, it's the energy of the object that it, object that's there because <laughs> of the object that's there. So in the case of dipole, if you have a positive charge in the vicinity of negative charge, 
there is potential energy associated with this um, with this arrangement alone. I mean, I can just quickly go through that. Um, the, this negative charge being here, it generates a potential. So at the distance of D, the potential due to the negative charge will be Coulomb constant times minus Q over D. So this uh, positive charge that's here, it's uh, at that electric potential. So there's a potential energy of interaction for this positive charge. And then interaction energy will be the charge, amount of charge plus Q times the potential or minus Coulomb constant times Q squared over D. So this is negative, um, it, which means it's a bound state. The, um, the positive charge and the negative charge, they attract each other. So they are bound to each other. And, um, and so there's that self energy. That's the self energy of a, a dipole. And it, I guess this is, I thought this would be worth pointing out because I think uh, as we are talking about electricity, uh, it is a fundamental law of nature. Almost <laughs> everything in life has uh, some electrical um, thing that's making it up, protons, electrons, not neutrons. Um, and sometimes there's this um, um, kind of uh, tunnels all the way down feeling where it's, um, you know, in the old mythologies about the model of the world, um, I guess one of the uh, Asian uh, mythologies uh, in the world is like something built on a top of a turtle and, and the, the, there's some amusing anecdote about a cosmologist who was talking with, giving a talk and a woman claiming that all that's uh, nonsense. And the woman says the world is, you know, stand, something on a turtle and the cosmologist asks, okay, then what's uh, underneath the turtle? And, um, and she says, there's a bigger turtle and what it's turtles all the way down. Sometimes it can get that way with the self energy. Uh, it, I don't mean this uh, only as a joke because um, without getting too deep into this, I want you to just want to just invite you to consider um, self energy of a point charge. And I think I can do one as a kind of a quick example, not of a point charge, but of a spherical shell, of a uniform spherical shell of charge um, so let's say I have a spherical shell of charge, total charge of charge of plus Q. There's energy, there's energy involved in bringing this amount of charge together in that spherical arrangement. I happen to know that voltage along the shell here V is equal to Coulomb constant times Q over the radius of the shell. So you might think the potential energy of the charges on the shell here is that potential energy is the amount of charge times the voltage um, or, you know, Ke times Q squared over R. It turns out there's a factor of a half. <laughs> <laughs> for the same reason as there was a factor of a half for the, the capacitor. You can get this half in different ways. You can get it through either integration, imagine building up that charge gradually, or you can get that by um, deliberate double counting and then you know, divide out the two, so because you know you double counted. So this is the expression for the self energy. This time it's a positive. So it takes energy to bring those charges together, put them in a confined space. Otherwise they would just repel each other. And when I talk about point charge, a point charge is something that's uh, at a singular space. It doesn't have a finite radius r, it, you know, to the <laughs> greatest extent we can determine it's at a um, singular space. Electron is an example of real life a point charge. As in, we don't have, we don't know a structure of an electron um, that we can, we, there's no such thing as a size of an electron. 
And that's where you run into a bit of a difficulty. <laughs> because if you took this formula as a given and you let R go to zero because it's a point charge, your potential energy goes to infinity. And um, so in this lower division electrostatics class or electromagnetism class, we ignore all that. <laughs> so we are not going to talk about self-energy of a point charge beyond this one amusing mention of it. And we are probably not even really going to talk about self-energy of uh, uh, dipole all that much. We are going to talk about uh, energy of a dipole interacting with external fields. And, um, and, and because uh, there are some, there are some um, pointed exceptions, as in self-energy of a capacitor. I want to highlight this so that, um, <laughs> so that you know, it's not confusing where, how, when we are talking about energy of a dipole interacting with an external field, there's no factor of one half, like that's not here. But there's a, whenever we are talking about energy of capacitor, or excuse me, later on, when we talk about energy stored in an inductor, there's gonna be another factor of a half again. So, because uh, that can sometimes seem very arbitrary, I want you to highlight that so that you know um, where the factor of a half comes from. So, so this is the description of a dipole interaction with an external field. 